bigger version of me. Oh well, it's fine. Hi everybody, I'm up in the corner. <laughs> oh, no one can see. I guess you guys can't see the screen. What? Let's see what that does. I was gonna run it on a separate computer. Uh, there. Now you Boy, guys. That's can, weird. Now you can see yourself. I know. Don't try not to pay too much attention to yourself on the screen. That's great. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go to just me for a second here, and then we'll. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to another virtual star party for, I don't know, I don't know, dates, times, nothing means anything. Is it the past? Is it the future? Um, I think it's November. Probably. It's March Vember. March Vember 2020 mm -hmm. or something. Anyway. <laughs> If you're wondering what it is that you've stumbled into, we're going to turn some telescopes on the sky and then we're just going to get silly for about an hour. So uh, if you have some questions about space, astronomy, um, how to use a telescope, uh, then you found the right place. Uh, let's hope we entertain you with our thrilling adventures in the night sky. All right. So uh, this week we've got... Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Hello, Fraser. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, for everyone who is maybe new and doesn't recall, uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci is a radio astronomer, aka noisy astronomer, um, a fan of flocculent galaxies. Oh, yes. I was so <laughs> hoping for one of those to yeah. come up. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure we I'll can do get... one next week. I yeah, we, we'll get we'll get flocculent next week. Um, or maybe maybe Linda can turn on on like M thirty three and yeah. and bring I'll us some flocculents. Well. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Um, but yeah, and so it's been a couple of years. And Nicole is is now a professor of right. astronomy <laughs> and has and her class is is going to be watching so hopefully hopefully good. well them. i mean yeah this is going to be on the test so <laughs> no stop saying that <laughs> it's on their lab it's on their lab well, me, don't i get to do a test then don't i get to provide a test yeah this is going to be on sure, the test that i care. yeah someone you're going to be tested no, we're gonna lose half Don't our audience. We're gonna lose half our audience. Oh, okay, all right. I know, I know. Everybody, everybody wanted to to get away from school. So yeah, all right, all right. I point taken, point taken. All right. Uh, on my screen right now, we got Molly Wakeling. Molly, welcome Hi. back. I am back. And uh, clear skies for the, for those who missed it. Hall, uh, Molly did double duty uh, this week. She was also one of our co-hosts on the weekly Space Hangout and demonstrated both uh, astronomy knowledge and uh, the science journalism knowledge as well. So you're you're the whole package, Molly. <laughs> I try. I try. Yeah, triple threat. Um, <laughs> all right. We've also got uh, Dr. Stuart Foreman, but not that kind of doctor. Well, I guess he is nope. that kind of doctor. Yeah, but I'm I'm a useless kind of doctor when it comes to astronomy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. We're already pretty useless as it is. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the medical kind, but and, medical and unfortunately kind of uh, tonight Much you uh, you don't have skies or no. or technology, but you figured you'd uh, stick around. And, I just and have I, fun. I thought I'd crash the party for a little. Yeah, bit. that sounds great. Um, and then last but not least, we got uh, Linda Thomas Fowler. Hey, Linda. Hey, Fraser. Uh, I'm here in Virginia, having survived a day of packing. And so if I get comatose at some point, just yell at me and I'll wake up. <laughs> right. And you're not going to be able to make it uh, next week. So no, I, the computers will be torn down and ready to move to the new place. So. Right, right, right. Do I see a star? I'm not seeing stars as brightly in your background as I did last week. No, it's it's not as bright. The conditions aren't as good this week as they were last week, but we're still got some clear spots out there. Right. So there might be a few sucker holes that we can. Yeah. We can and, get some. And I think we got enough suckers here to, to find them. <laughs> <laughs> so we got two telescopes rolling. We got Molly and Linda, uh, and then we've got three. And then uh, we had the Landers telescope working. It's everything is going great, except the software to connect to it is broken. So. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to bring that telescope next week. 
promise I'll have I'll be able to bring another telescope. All right, Nancy Graziano wants to know what what kind of beer you brewed today, Stuart. <laughs> we brewed a barley wine and a blonde ale. Wow, mm. and that's why I can't do astronomy tonight because I'm in <laughs> no condition to handle. I was the covering for you, man. Yeah, it's all right. We were. You're not science. sharing, Stuart. I'm disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Molly, let, let's start with your with your Mars because it's really amazing. Sure. All right. Oh, that's amazing! Isn't that terrific? Yeah. So I've got I've got Mars in here. My singing appears to be pretty good tonight. Yeah. So um, you can kind of see. Um, you're supposed to be seeing my mouse. There it is. Um, the, uh, uh, the some of these darker features here are some of the um, surface features of Mars. Some of the the darker areas, which I think are mountains and, and hills and, and those kind of regions that are a little darker than the uh, more lighter red dust around the rest of Mars. Um, I can't at uh, this. Uh, I have my focal reducer on. This is my my deep sky imaging telescope ordinarily, so um, I don't have as much resolution as I could get out of the scope. So you can't quite see the ice cap that I've been able to get some other times. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, it's still some pretty cool features here. That I and, think and that's you're one video, right? I think that's yeah. the yeah. nicest image of Mars that we've had on the Star Party ever. Absolutely. Yeah, I think cool. that's the best one we've ever had. Yeah, so this is this is a live view of of Mars here, playing at um, sixty five frames per second. Although I'm sure it's not coming that fast over the internet connection. Um, <clears throat> I just took a video of it that I'm uh, currently processing. Uh, the debayering is is being weird, so I'm going to have to use um, another program to debayer it before I run it through Auto Stacker. But um, should hopefully, as long as something went weird, I will have a, a nice looking image of Mars to show before the end of the show where I've processed it which is basically I've taken a couple thousand frames on it and am undoing the effects of the atmosphere, the, the swirling effects of the atmosphere um, by uh, doing some averaging and some wavelet deconvolution, which is a mathematical process. <laughs> well, last, mathematical. Last it really week. is though, it's magic. Like yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I have a physics degree and I'm working on my Jorge PhD in physics and it's still, it's still magic. <laughs> um, <laughs> transforms are magic. It's true. Yeah. They really well, are though. <laughs> well, That's last week we had Shaw on your, with us yeah. and he was viewing the sun live and he did the same thing, recorded yeah. uh, five minutes of this sunspot group on the sun and then turned it into uh and, you, and then compared it side by side so you could really see the difference between how the um you know how the post processing works but can you give us just like a you know obviously you don't want to go into the fourier transforms and the and the uh linear algebra that's going into this but what is the um, what like what's kind of happening when this software is stacking up and producing one of these clear images Sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, so if you if you've looked through the eyepiece before, or and you can see it in the camera as well, you can see the atmosphere is swirling and is turbulent because there's a lot of of activity in the air in the miles between your telescope aperture and outer space, and so there's lots of distortions that are happening to that light. But those distortions are changing rapidly, and every frame is going to look a little bit different. In one frame, there'll be a clear spot in on one part of Mars and be blurry in another. In another frame, it'll be clear here and blurry here. And uh, so, so if you take if you take a few thousand frames, usually I do one to two thousand, uh, depending on on my exposure time, then. You can you can you take an average first. Well, actually, the first thing you do is uh, you run it through some software that grades the images and looks at which ones are clear versus which ones are, are the most blurry. And then you make a cut and say, I'm going to keep 20 percent or 15 percent or uh, however many images you decide that you want to use. This is a bit touchy feely. <laughs> and then. Um, and then the software averages those frames and you end up with an image that looks pretty blurry but has a little bit of, of the of kind of the, the clear spots and the fuzzy spots all kind of buried inside of that data set. But then you run it through another piece of software called Registax, which applies, and there's other software that does this too, but this one's really easy, 
uh, it applies what's called a wavelet deconvolution. So it's looking at the different layers, the different pixel sizes of the image. So like one pixel, two by two, three by three, these different pixel scales. And is um, I don't know the exact, or I think I have learned some of the exact math behind it, but yeah. um, I don't remember it <laughs> uh, or didn't get familiar with, with it enough to just be able to spout it offhand. But um, essentially what's happening is you're undoing the blurring of the atmosphere and you end up with a really nice sharp image at the end uh, because of the averaging and then the, the sharpening. Yeah. Figuring and out how many big blobs there are and how many small blobs basically and and undoing that blobbiness yeah exactly yeah um i i sort of imagine it like you're just like frankenstein's monstering it you're just stitching together the best pixels across all of those frames thousands of frames each little piece and then trying to make it into the single best image so you're just yeah, taking this... like a highlight reel of 2000 frames. <laughs> yeah, and the software is handling all that. And it's actually a very quick process, especially yeah. if your image size is small. I crop the camera down when I'm taking these videos to get just, just enough area around the planet. That way I can suck down at a much higher frame rate so then I get more frames when in those moments of clear seeing. And um, then, so I get, so I get this couple thousand frames um, and yeah, it works out all in the end. It comes out in the wash. <laughs> and it's a, it's a super satisfying process. Like if if you want to get into astronomy and astrophotography, like the cheaper telescopes, you even a a Dobsonian, you know, you can spend a couple of hundred dollars and get a pretty good telescope. You can even hook up your iPhone as a, to the eyepiece. There's clips that'll let you put your iPhone or or you know pixel or whatever your mobile phone up to the eyepiece and record your video and you can produce a stacked image out of that that looks pretty amazing especially like really bright objects like the moon jupiter saturn with some patience and some practice and not a lot of expense you'll be pretty uh pretty pleased with with what you can accomplish with fairly humble gear you don't so need a nice you don't need a nice camera either. Um, no. The the little planet, the little guide cameras that you can get for doing auto guiding, like the ASI 120, um, like the $100, $150 guide cameras were yeah. great for planetary. I think the best image of Saturn that I've taken was with the ASI 120 MM. I had color filters for it. And um, I, that's been hands down my best image of Saturn. And you can you can plug it into if you have a Dobsonian without any tracking, you can hand track it using your Telrad. And, um, you know, because the, the exposure time is so short that you don't need to be super precise. Yeah, as long right. as it's still inside of your frame, you can process it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, the, and the so other thing I that... have oh, a, ahead, I Nicole. have a little I have a little army of, of eight inch Dobbs in our campus observatory. Nice. So I'm thinking this is going to be a future lab for mm. next yeah, time we can actually do awesome. labs. Yeah. yeah, the cameras oh, yeah. are cheap, like like Molly was saying. They're they're well, relatively cheap. I've got cameras. a bunch of the clips for phones yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that eight inch an eight inch daub mm -hmm. is perfect. And then you just yep. you know you're going to have to keep it on stay on target, but then the software will align the the images yeah. and yep. and build you this one photo and yeah, the magic really comes in your patience and willingness to to massage it through to completion because it's like you've got to you've got to be able to see like which are the bad frames throw them out which are the good frames and then that 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 as molly was mentioning that percentage right where you're like okay are you are you gonna cut off just the absolute crappiest frames where are you gonna draw that line and um, and then uh, moving all the the sliders around because for the wavelet deconvolution you're you're moving some sliders for the yeah. different pixel scales and it's real easy to overdo it and get weird artifacts and stuff like that. So there's some finesse yeah. in, in applying the wavelet deconvolution. But fortunately for for the user, um, there's there's you don't have to do any calculations. You don't have to do any um, any weird stuff. It's a pretty. It's probably the it's it uses the cheapest equipment. Yep. And is the least amount of work for processing, yeah. uh, and all the software to process is free. So yeah. planetary imaging 
if you have a long focal length telescope like a Smith Cassegrain or a Dobsonian, it's a really great place to start astrophotography. Yeah. And so when you see those pictures on Twitter that are just like really detailed pictures of Jupiter or Saturn or the moon or or Mars or whatever, that's the technique that they're doing. And yeah. don't don't be intimidated by this process. You can get in fairly inexpensively, cut your teeth on it really learn a lot and not be too deep in before deciding no you've had a, you're sick of this hobby or you want to go deeper and and start to chase that that you know that deep next deeper. level and that, gear that what you're that process you're describing i mean that is a great process of science lesson in itself yes um I think of everything in terms of pedagogy. This is just where I am right now in my life. <laughs> so yeah. I'm thinking, oh my God, this is perfect because one of the big things I've been trying to get across this semester is the subjective nature of humans doing science and how that affects the results. Um, so yeah, getting that that artistic bit in there is is so important. Well, it's interesting because that the whole process of setting up the telescope and learning to keep it on target, especially if it's a Dobsonian and you're like a little to the left, a little up, a little to the left, a little up, right? Um, so you're trying to get as long of data as you possibly can. And then at the same time, you are, um, you're then trying to record, but you've got all night that Mars is going to be up there in the sky. And so you can just keep going, trying and trying and trying to get that longer and longer chunk of video and then turn it into something. So um, Molly, your, your screen went gray. I don't know if that was, if you see that uh, on your end. I um, I flipped, sorry. I, I didn't know I was going to do that. I okay. switched to a different desktop screen so I could process that image. So yeah, no problem. No problem. Good to know. I didn't know it was going to do that. So yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of much further down the rabbit hole, uh, Linda, <laughs> It's usually where I am now. <laughs> you're, on, you're, you're on the other side. There's a lot of a lot of iron behind you there. Yeah, let me sw switch over to. Uh, oh, is that the pelican? The current image. Pelican, yeah. Yeah. So we've got not not a flocculent galaxy this time, but a, a non-flocculent nebula. <laughs> Floofy. It's floofy. Yeah. <laughs> Come so up with we, a motion for everything. Then, yeah. <laughs> um, so we have uh, IC5070, which is more popularly known as the Pelican. You can see the uh, the beak here, and, and there's the eye glaring at you, and the body down here. And this is right near the North American Nebula. Um, and so um, this is a, a really popular target for imagers, especially in the the summer and the early fall. Um, and this is two minutes of hydrogen alpha data binned two by two. So, so we actually got a question that. about this. Um, uh, Ronald Minch asked, I understand most telescopes can use a light filter. How effective are they and are there cheap fakes? So uh, how effective how effective is a light pollution filter for the for the photos that you're taking? So, so the filters that we're using, or at least that I'm using, are not light pollution filters. This is a narrow band filter. So it's designed to let through just that one specific emission line, in this case, that, that hydrogen puts out. And there are light pollution filters that you can get for both visual and imaging purposes. And they can have some effectiveness. They tend to have less effectiveness as the city lights that we're using are more broadband. Um, you know, when cities used to use a lot of uh, the sodium or mercury lights, they were relatively easy to filter out. But now that they've gone to broadband LEDs, they're a little bit harder to filter because they're all over the spectrum instead of in one spot. So, but I mean, the, I mean, if you live in a light polluted area and you want to take pictures like deep sky pictures like this, you've got to go with that narrow band filter. You don't have to, but it makes life a lot easier. Um, you can overcome the light pollution and broadband by just going longer and longer and longer integration times. So instead of going maybe an, an hour or two hours on an image, maybe eight or 12 or 14 or 100. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but with narrowband, you really cut out a lot of that light pollution. Yeah, so I, um, when I do broadband I'm, I'm in a i'm in the bay area and i'll do broadband sometimes but yeah i do longer times and i just i compensate for the the sky glow just by taking more images 
and um, uh, you know there there's advantages for being in a dark sky, but um, you know, but like Molly and I are just not in dark sky. So we, <laughs> yeah, we, we get we get what we get. Yeah, I do. I was just about to. I I do escape up to a, a dark sky site um, about once a month or so, but now that winter's coming on, they get snow up there, and it's not going to work mm. so well. Yeah, the light pollution filter helps a lot, but I do much better with the narrowband filters, which are unfortunately a lot more expensive, mm -hmm. but uh, get really, really awesome results. But they're only good for nebula. You can't do like galaxies. Not Well, I mean, you can, you can, can. enhance galaxies with hydrogen data, but you can't get a complete image of a galaxy with just narrowband. I, when I was imaging with my um, with my Canon camera, I had a clip-in light pollution filter that worked reasonably well. Um, yeah. I ended up getting rid of it um, just because I just ended up going longer exposures. But um, I've seen a lot of people you know, really like those little clip-in filters, and they're pretty cheap. Yeah, yeah I use. The, uh, go ahead. The, I was going to say the challenge with those filters is they really um, mess up your color balance. Yeah. So you got to work. It's really easy to fix, though. Really easy yeah. to fix. I never had and, that continue to be an issue when I got decent at processing. No, you just you just it it comes out blue. You just have to you just have to, to, just right yeah. so, to correct it. Yeah. So Nicole, I want to put you to work here. Just uh, what are we looking at? Good question. So if we are looking at um, the hydrogen alpha line, uh, I just <laughs> we just talked about this in my in my quantum physics uh, modern class uh, about yeah. getting the whole yeah 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 we, we did the wave function <laughs> and we got you know spectral lines and it's like what the heck is this? Um, so that is um, a transition in hydrogen uh, that gives off a specific kind of pinkish light. Um, and you see a lot of these in these what we call H2 regions. So H2 mean, in, in, in this case means ionized hydrogen. Um, so that is, um, often you see those around star formation. Um, so I don't know how much star formation is going on in this particular area, um, but that is something that uh, when you have this gas starting to clump together in denser regions, um, you will eventually have smaller and smaller dense regions that could eventually form um, form stars. And there's probably some dust in there as well from those dark lanes that I see in there. Yeah, some uh, molecular yeah. dust. There, there, and through there. Yeah, so if you had an infrared camera, the dust would be glowing, uh, which would be something completely different. But But these are associated with star formation. Yes. Right. Yes. So that so the, the the bright ultraviolet light from from newborn large stars that you know live fast and die young, um, that ultraviolet light will uh, help ionize that hydrogen, and so you get that um, that effect of of ripping the electron away from the atom from with that ultraviolet light. Right. Right. Um... Yeah. And as a radio astronomer, you probably see a, a lot more of another emission of hydrogen oh, at yes. a, a microwave or radio wavelength of 21 centimeters, right? <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite. I also, I was like, we're talking about spin and I'm going to talk about this because even though this is a quantum class, I'm a radio astronomer. <laughs> yeah, hydrogen's great. Hydrogen's everywhere. Anything that, you know, any of these spectral lines of hydrogen, because like with the light pollution discussion, we have the same thing um, in, in radio astronomy. If you if you can narrow it down just to that frequency, um, you know, we have a lot of hydrogen there. And I think that's one of the few protected frequencies. Yeah. yeah. Very, very tiny, tiny sliver of the radio spectrum that's that's still protected for radio astronomy because it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. The with the with the hydrogen, the I mean, this is the way to figure out, in fact, like the earliest stages of the entire universe, because mm -hmm. you have vast clouds of hydrogen that will give off this one photon randomly over fairly every long once, periods every of once time. Every once in a few million yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you, it's like ridiculous how, how not often it is. Right, yeah. right, right. But it, but it appears in this exact 21 centimeter line. And so you can probe and find where these clouds of hydrogen are. And that tells you where future star formation can happen across the entire universe from here in the Milky Way to right out to the edge of the observable universe. 
Well, that's where things get tricky because as you look to further and further distances, because of the expansion of the universe, everything is is starting to look redshifted. So that 21 centimeter line is no longer 21 centimeters. It goes to um, you know a longer and longer wavelength, which is not protected. Um, mm. So it's it becomes much more challenging for radio astronomers to to work out at those frequencies. Yeah, radio yeah. telescope in space <laughs> <laughs> on the moon on the moon on the, on the far on the, side of the moon on the, yeah. on the far side of the moon yeah did, did, have you seen this there's a there's a plan to build a radio telescope um one of the nyack uh i think it's one of the nyack plans it, it would land a lander on the moon and then it would it would have this rover that would crawl out and lay out a gigantic flower shaped radio telescope like the Murchison array, but everything would be connected. And so I'm laughing yes. because my thesis advisor was involved in in this discussion like I don't know how long ago was I in grad school? A long time okay, ago. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's still it's still yes, gonna happen. I know that's that's one of the frustrating things about space-based astronomy. Yeah, or, you know, yeah. it's they've been talking about it forever. Yeah, I I, I blogged about it once. Um, okay, and I had a little right. picture of Wally. Yeah. Like I just imagining Wally on the surface of the moon, just, <laughs> just laying like, out little radio yeah. telescopes one after the other. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, like, yeah, no, yeah. One of the things this telescope would be able to do, for example is detect the interaction between a planet's magnetosphere and solar flares coming off its star. Oh, so it would okay. actually be able to tell if a planet has a global magnetosphere orbiting around another star. Which That'd could make cool. it habitable. Which could make it habitable, yeah. <laughs> so you bet you match that with a planet that is in the habitable zone of the star and it has a global magnetosphere and you suddenly it's not a gas giant. <laughs> Jupiter yeah. and Saturn have. Some well, no, no, no. You would no be a, a trust. You know, you've already looked at it with James Webb, probed its atmosphere. You've already looked at it with Habex. You know, you there's other telescopes at play here at this point, but then you're also using a um That'd be pretty awesome. a, a a chance to see whether it has a magnetosphere, and that's that's that appears to be one of the most like one of the big requirements for life is to have that protective yes. magnetosphere. You can right. shift pictures anytime you want anybody. We're just killing time here. <laughs> we will vamp about astronomy yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hours. I've, I've got another picture. Yeah, no, here. don't don't wait for us. We're waiting, I know, I, we're, I didn't. we're killing time for you. <laughs> it's taking yeah. another exposure. We're doing this, we're doing this. Yeah, I'm gonna go find another target while, while Linda's talking. Um. And there's clouds in the way. Yeah, this is not your best work, Linda. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so, Nicole, how bad is the new damage at oh. um, at our? I have not caught up on that yet. Um, oh. My go-to person for that is uh, Sandy Springman. You probably mm -hmm. know yeah, her on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Sandy. Um, I know she uh, saw um, something from her earlier that she was getting updates on that. So I don't actually know. I haven't read the updates today. I have mm. been cleaning the house because my <laughs> life is exciting. <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah. I don't really have, have any new insight on that. I did bring Sandy um, and uh, another yeah. friend of mine, Kristen Jones, who... Um, both astronomers both worked at Arecibo for for several years um, at DragonCon, and so I have that video, and I still need to post it because it was it was only up briefly, um, where they talked. I just I I invited them, and then I just set them off, and they just they were so much love for Arecibo and so much detail about it yeah. um, that it was really exciting. But it sounds it sounds bad, but from what I remember from our discussion at DragonCon is they there is still it could have been worse because they were still repairing things from hurricane maria and mm -hmm. so they still had the money to do that stuff that they hadn't repaired yet and so like some of it's kind of already paid for in that way but i think mm -hmm. um today's thing was a like a structural concern yeah the so the so there's the one that happened about two months ago was one of the support cables and right. snapped down and they they had just put in the requisition for about $10 million to repair it. Yeah. And then just a couple of days ago, one of the main cables broke. And so you're now left with Oh, that's a big deal. Yeah. So so now the the sort of the supporting the entire weight of the of the observatory of that of that sort of big 
you know, the part where the James where James Bond fights up on right. top of that yeah, yeah. is the part that's Zero! being yeah, yeah that's being supported by one less cable, and so now they've yeah. they've put in some extra support uh, as quickly as they could to try and stabilize things, but it's pretty dire at this point that yeah. they've got to work quickly. Uh, the place is known to have earthquakes. Obviously, it's known to have um, known to have uh, um, hurricanes, okay. bad weather. Are they on Hurricane yeah. Iota or something yeah. ridiculous and, like that now? And yeah. it was already, I mean, this is an observatory that has, has been battling for funding year after year after year. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. for it to go through this one-two punch yeah. is is bad. Yeah. yeah, I uh, finally got to visit it in, well, June, not last June, but the June before, because um, my friend Kristen was a postdoc there. Um, that was that was on my bucket list was to see Arecibo and uh, actually get to climb up to the, you know, the platform and where the secondary yeah. is and all that fun stuff. So, um, yeah, getting to meet the people working there was really awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Frida, what do we got here? I was, the thing that I was trying to image was this, <laughs> this. This is uh, Pac-Man, and this is uh, an image I just actually completed a, a couple days ago, and this is uh, a broadband image. This wasn't done with narrowband filters, but just red, green, and blue filters. Yep. So uh, this is about, instead of two minutes of data, this is about 11 hours of data stacked together. Right. And so why is this one in color and your other, your Pelican was black and white? So in the Pelican, we got just the hydrogen alpha. So the sensor is actually monochrome. And then by blocking out certain groups of light, we can make a color image. So here we had a red filter that let through just the red, a green filter that let through just the green, and a blue that let through just the blue. And um, when we put those together in a red, green, and blue combination in the computer, we get a color image that looks like this. Um, but when we look at just the hydrogen alpha data, we're just looking at one of those channels, which is on its own, just monochrome. And let's yeah. see. I think I'd mentioned that the hydrogen alpha line is is a pinkish color. This is more the color, like oh, the real go. color of it. Yeah. And yeah. so here is, let me get it rotated the same way. Um, this is two minutes and that's 11 hours <laughs> and- <laughs> Wild. Wow. How Wild. long are the exposures on the 11 hour one though? They're short. Because the stars are pretty compact, so you went with pretty short exposures there. The, the exposures were four minutes. I actually did do some star reduction mm. on the final image because star killer base. In in uh, Cassiopeia, where Pac Man is, there's just so many stars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and without the star reduction, it's like there's red things, but there's all these you know white dots in front of it. So to tame the stars to make the nebula a little more visible I tame the stars a little bit yeah it's great to see it's, that that the the comparison to just to for people to sort of see what the what the quick and dirty version is and then the the one that you've pulled yeah. together 11 hours of data examined the frames um put together the you know reduce the stars kill the few stars yeah. Now that that uh, the mouth of the Pac-Man, that sort of darker region there, is that is that like just a hole in the clouds, or is that a dark nebula? It's probably dust there. Yeah, it probably... looks like dust. Yeah. Yeah. And then those those stars are probably foreground stars that are in front of the dust. Yeah. 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 The way it's shaded behind the stars um, makes it look to me like it's it's dust there. Um, any chance of uh, M31? Sure. Um, no, well, not. I should say, sure, let me check the all sky camera. So Horizon Brave is asking, yeah. um, can you ask what software they're using? I have a demo of, I have a demo of Pix Insight, but it's such a steep learning curve. It is, yeah. Yeah, for for the, uh, for what I'm, sh for what I'm showing, like when I show the live view, I'm using uh, Sharp Tap just to show that live view. But when I'm acquiring data, I use Sequence Generator Pro, and then I process it in, in PixInsight for the deep sky data. When I'm doing planets, I use AutoStackert and Registax. For deep sky, I use PixInsight. 
And uh, uh, light, uh, light Vortex Astronomy uh, is a website that has some excellent tutorials on how to use PixInsight and how to get started. How, how long yeah. did it take you to understand this? Like how to use PixInsight or astrophotography? Yeah, just to, to understand the whole <laughs> stack. I, I'm i pretty quick at learning stuff, especially when it comes to things that are technical and computer-based and stuff like that. Um, I started with Deep Sky Stacker when I, when I first started, just to kind of figure out how to stack and what was needed and what makes a good frame and a bad frame. And then I would, uh, and then I moved on, I uh, used Deep Sky Stacker in conjunction with Photoshop. And then yeah. I finally started using PixInsight. I think I, I felt like I kind of started hitting my stride with PixInsight probably about six months to a year in. Um, and now I've been using it for two years and I feel about ready to, to really dive deep into some of the more right. complicated processes. There, there's a website that you can look at called easypixinsight.com that has some free videos by um, uh, Warren, Warren Keller. Keller. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, he has a paid site that's also really good called IP4AP and Adam Block has good videos and yeah. Rogelio um, just, uh, everybody calls him RBA, just, just uh, produced a book and Warren has a book. So there's a lot of good resources out there. Um, but the Light Vortex Astronomy is a good start and the easypixinsight.com is a free site that Warren and Peter put together that um, I also recommend. So what's the, what's the software stack that you use, Stuart? Me? Yeah. I use PixInsight as well. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I used to use Deep Sky Stacker, which is free, um, and then went out of Photoshop. But I went and I've gone just to PixInsight because it, um, it works. It works for me, mm -hmm. and I was never able to kind of grok Photoshop in the layers. So. Yeah, yeah. I've tried to do Photoshop so many times and just said, forget it. Um, yeah, it's. I'm just. I'm just not smart enough for the layers and stuff. So, yeah. PixInsight to me is more linear, and it's yeah. just more mathematical and more scientific. And I just like. This. I use Nebulosity, but just because it lets me go fast for yeah. the star parties. And so I'm, sure. you know, I'm, I'm able to sort of do a really quick and dirty process. Yeah. Um, I've done some stacking and stuff with Nebulosity, but I, I'm not a big fan of the software beyond yeah. doing the quick and dirty work. It sounds like Molly and I do pretty much exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Linda- While we're talking about equipment, I'm gonna bring up a question from my lab, which mm -hmm. is what types of telescopes are you using? Oh, yes. Uh, well, I've, uh, I'll, I'll put my, um, I don't have anything good to show right now, but on my webcam view here, um, or on my, on my OBS view, I have a picture of my telescope. So this is a, this is an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain from Celestron on a Paramount Mighty. So this is a, a, a computerized German equatorial mount, one of the higher end ones. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> worth worth it hashtag worth it <laughs> uh, right now i have a color astro cmos camera on there a zwo asi 294 mc pro so what that means is it's um sort of like a dslr in the sense that it takes all the colors with with one shot instead of doing a monochrome camera with multiple filters that's what i usually use on this telescope but for for doing uh star parties and stuff um, people like to see color in their images mm -hmm. yep um and yeah, we learned that lesson. Those are the planetary images. Um, so I have the color camera on there, except uh, in as opposed to a DSLR, it's it's cooled, so the noise is a lot lower, and it's uh, it doesn't have a, the spectrum filter that makes it's like on your cell phone camera it has this filter over it so that uh, the co the colors look like how your eyes see them, but that blocks out a lot of red. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of red in space because there's a lot of hydrogen in space. Um, so we, we really want that red. So this camera doesn't have any, any kind of filtering on it, no infrared filter, no color filters. Um, well, I mean, it has the red, green, blue filters on it. But <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what I have. That's awesome. interesting because people always say like, oh, I want to know what it really looks like to my eyes. Well, yeah. your eyes, I think this came up last week, right? Yeah. The meat cameras are not very good. Your <laughs> well, eyes I do, don't do a good job of picking up all the light you'd actually want to see. Yeah, and I do like in processing, 
I balance the colors so that they look like how your eye would see it. Um, mm -hmm. PixInsight actually has this super cool tool called um, Photometric Color Calibration. And what that does is um, it, it finds a sun-like star in your image by plate solving it and knowing okay. where you're pointing in the sky. And it uses that as the white reference mm. so that um, it so the colors get balanced because um, our eyes are tuned to the wavelength spectrum mm. of the sun. Uh, because that's how we evolved. So um, it, it sets the colors like how our eyes would see it if if our eyes yeah. were bigger and more sensitive. But our eyes are not very good. We want to see those rich yeah. pinks and infrared. Well, I mean, you, you still get the reds, but um, right. like the balance of the red, green, and blue yeah. it looks different. more natural yeah. Um, yeah. than like just being yeah. suffused. But the reality is that the heartbreaking reality is there is no place you could go in space and see a yeah, nebula as nicely true. as the pictures. By the time you get close enough to it for it to be bright, it's huge and spread out and you're inside of it. You know, it's, yeah. it's yep. it, you wouldn't yeah. know you were in it. Yeah, you wouldn't even know you were in it. So, yeah, exactly. So Take people that always Star Trek. Yeah, people always Yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> but a globular sorry, a globular cluster. That would globular. look amazing. Globular. 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 Yeah. What is this? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for talking I wonder over my about brief a, technical about like a planetary nebula. <laughs> They're pretty Anytime. small and bright. <laughs> I don't know why it wouldn't take input from me, but I restarted it and it's happy. If you hey, if you were pretty works. close, um, I wonder if like yeah, a, if like a planetary nebula would look good. I can uh, do the the ring nebula. I think. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Like, a, like if you were a light year away from the ring nebula, what oh, would you oh, see? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah. yeah those are a lot smaller. There's yeah, more be like compact. Yeah, levels. I wonder if they'd be bright. And um, they might be a little bit denser than most of the other stuff since yeah, they're yeah. So compact. That's true. Yeah. Linda's got. A... Oh, that's still packed. I tried to get oh. the. Uh, We've got M thirty one coming. But um, it's kind of behind a tree, and my stars <laughs> are getting weird spikes on them. So. <laughs> I just, I'm just anticipating some some uh, gardening, some tree trimming shortly. I, I, ju I just last week cut off two branches on my plum tree because they were hanging right over Zenith and it was really annoying. So there's a lot of targets I want to image up there. Yeah. So <laughs> I climbed the tree and I cut them down last weekend. <laughs> I really just want that whole tree gone, but I don't own the house, so I can't oh. like chop it down. Yeah. <laughs> I've had, I've, yeah, yeah, we've had. We've had campus uh, grounds grounds people take down trees by our observatory. I feel bad, <laughs> but like we got to see stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rachel, I have a narrow band image of of, uh, of oh, Pac Man. Man. Oh, great! Here, I'll so this here. is this is just a different view of the same image that um, um, uh, Linda, Linda had. Yeah. Doing. And this is not this is not RGB. This is narrow band um, with three different narrow band filters, um, uh, S203 and H2. And I can let Nicole kind of talk about them, but these are combined into the so-called Hubble palette where sulfur is mapped to red, hydrogen is mapped to blue right. and um, oxygen is, uh, no, yeah. Other way. Or, yeah. Uh, uh, so for um, hydrogen, oxygen, RGB. Right. 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 Yeah. So right. So this um, uh, and this is about thirty hours of data. Thirty hours of data, but 30. from your wow. from your front yard, right? From my front yard. Yeah. yeah. And my in terms of the answer, of my equipment, I I'm running a hundred forty millimeter refractor on an astrophysics Mach one mount, which is sort of the equivalent of what um, ninety. Yeah. Yeah, the mighty mount. Kind of, uh, it's kind of the equivalent astrophysics mount to the mighty mount. Yeah, that's beautiful though. Incredible mm. work. Yeah. Yeah. Now my my equipment is a little bit more modest. I'm using an. Uh, this is not what we're actually using tonight. But my equipment is an eighty millimeter refractor, so it's a little telescope. Um, yeah. On on a Skywatcher EQ six R mount, uh, but this telescope is an astrophysics Riccardi Honders. 305 millimeter telescope. Ooh, that's yeah. a good telescope. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to, you know, 
hit the owner over the head and take it with me. But, <laughs> um, but uh, it's on a, a 10 micron GM 3000 mount. So really, really nice equipment. Um, oh, it's good. Uh, two one one two one two one one two is uh, talking about what's <laughs> happening with the uh, yeah with the telescope <laughs> in the chat. So you totally got distracted by that too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah it's really good information. So thank you very so much yeah, for the, putting that in. Yeah, if you're if you're not in the chat, um, yeah, saying that the cable didn't break, but it slipped out. So right. it's but the main thing is worker safety. Yeah. yeah, having having been on that platform, it's yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> Um, and so the telescope that I use is uh, an 11 inch Rasa, which is um, with the same camera that Molly's using, and it has a Celestron mount because they took the, the nice mount away. Yeah, I know. You ha used to have the same mount that you've got. I have and then broken, they... I've had three of my Celestron mounts break um, in the last three years. Yeah. And, uh, Two more that are still functioning at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> so hopefully next week I'll be able to to join, and it's it's a nice balance between what Linda's got and what and what Molly's doing. But yeah. Um, so we we have here the galaxy that's coming to kill us all. <laughs> <laughs> right. Andromeda Galaxy. Oh, no, he's not gonna kill us all. No. She's gonna make an AGN. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Galactic nuclei. <laughs> Ooh, I'm about to get a nice shot of M33 coming up here. So oh, give nice. Me a minute. Nicole will be happy. I will be very happy. But M31 yeah. makes me very happy too. Our our our, our friendly neighbor, our friendly popular. neighborhood spiral galaxy. We get three galaxies oh. for the price of one. Woo! X X Richie Locks X is a young troll. He's uh -oh. only nine years old and already getting himself banned from our channel. Oh. Yeah. Wait, what <laughs> I remember doing stupid crap like yeah. that. Yeah. I wasn't on the internet when I was nine. But yeah. Maybe 12, try again 13? next week. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't yeah. have internet when I was nine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah try again next week. Me neither. Uh, we've got moderators that are on it. But, uh, but thanks for coming and making our lives a little more difficult. I would say entertaining. Entertaining. But probably difficult for You're Nancy. Keeping Nancy busy. <laughs> uh, she just only timed you out for 300 seconds. It's five minutes. So you're just going to have to wait for five minutes. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, coming up with AGN. Um, so, Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way Galaxy are on a collision course, um, which sounds really awful, except <laughs> that. There's so much empty space in space that this, <laughs> when galaxies collide, the stars don't. Yeah. They just kind of through each other in this like gorgeous gravitational dance. But the gas clouds can collide and make a heck of a lot, a lot of star formation. And some of that gas can funnel its way to the supermassive black holes at the center of these galaxies, which right now aren't doing a whole lot. But if you start throwing gas at them, um, then you're going to have a very bright disk of material around that black hole, all trying to fall into that black hole. Yeah. That's what we call an active galactic nucleus or AGN. Bring your picture back. There we go. Thanks, Linda. So it's not an AGN. Oh, okay, okay. It'll make one. That's, It'll make one. No clouds in front of Andromeda unless it's star clouds. Yeah, it's uh, Andromeda is always beautiful through the telescope. Mm -hmm. You got all the dust lanes and the, there was a really the interesting core. paper that just came out a couple of days ago talking about astronomers have been able to to track the chemical constituents and the velocities of the globular. Oh, you got me saying it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Of the globular yes. cluster surrounding the Milky Way. And they've been able to use that to actually track back all of the collisions that brought the, all the dwarf galaxies that came together to create the Milky Way. Oh, that's legit. And so it's yeah, like the they, family tree of the Milky Way. That's pretty I went, awesome. So I, I went to UVA and uh, Steve Majeski is one of the astronomers who who did a lot of that. And uh, they he made they made they made this. Um, I think there someone had made a, a model of these things coming together. And when they went and put their data up from you know how these things came together from different dwarf galaxies, they picked the same exact color palette. And so it was like crazy how how well it matched. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I mean, Milky Way just looks 
you think it's this great big grand spiral galaxy, but actually, you know, it is the combination of all of these smaller galaxies that all came together one after the other gobbled up. And the, the galaxy even has a warp in it. And so you can and the it's like the the globular clusters are these fossils embedded in the halo around the galaxy. And and Andromeda has its share of them, too. And each one of them is mm -hmm. is just a record of the snacks that Andromeda had in the past. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> like the, pack, like man. Batman. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's so, amazing so, that in a lot of ways, astronomers are like the forensic scientists yeah. of the universe, you know. So, what? Nicole, with this shot of Andromeda, can you, what are some things that we're seeing in this picture? So um, I'm always drawn, I think someone just mentioned it a, a minute ago to those dust lanes. Um that you see on um, like the front edge of it, uh, because that is again that uh, molecular material. Um, it's not quite like the dust bunnies under your bed. The, the particles are a lot, lot smaller, and it sounds boring calling it dust, but there's all kinds of fascinating chemistry and cool stuff that happens with this dust, um, as well as you know the stars and gas. So in most of these spiral galaxies, the star formation is happening in the disk in these spiral arms, which you can kind of get a sense from in in, um, in this image from this angle, you know, from the angle that that Andromeda is to us. Um, and just that uh, bright region in the center, which I can't remember if Andromeda has a weak bar or not, because some oh, spirals I don't know. are just spiral and some bar spirals have this like rectangular shape that comes out because of the way that orbits. And I can't remember yeah. if this was one that had a really like weak bar. I, I think it does, but I'm not positive. I'm not sure. And again, I, my office mates at UVA I used to work on this stuff and I've like forgotten. <laughs> it's, it sounds like it's not super clear yet. Let me see. Yeah, okay. So the inclination of M31 is too close to edge on for a bar component to be easily recognized and is not sufficiently edge on for a boxy peanut bulge to protrude clearly out of the equatorial plane. Peanut! <laughs> right. <laughs> So I've got like, M33 here. It's whenever. at the perfect angle where it's tough to see whether or not Oops. it has a bar. Thanks, universe. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll um, be able to tell in a couple billion and then, years. And then that core, what's going on in the middle? Um, so the core of uh, of a of a sp large spiral galaxy has the a really dense spherical compact um, center of stars. So you can have star from you have new old new stars, you have old stars, um, and star formation all happening there. So we're just seeing the combined light of just all the stars. It's not an active galactic nucleus there. Um, it's black hole is fairly quiet as well. That's just starlight we're seeing, right? Star and gas. I mean, it's a 100 million times the mass of the sun. Mm -hmm. But it's not actively feeding. Right. Today. It's not actively feeding on gas. And same thing with our supermassive black hole. Um, you only see that activity when there's a lot of things trying to get into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's phenomenal, though. It's such a great picture. And then the two blobbies above and below. I don't remember their names. There are two of its many... Go ahead. M M32 and M110. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Two of its dwarf galaxies, two of its many. Each each each, you know, Andromeda and Milky Way each have like this whole host of these smaller galaxies. Um tracing back to, you know, this this idea of hierarchical formation like you you build big galaxies out of smaller galaxies that eventually merge together, um, but they've still each got their little entourage, I guess, of of dwarf galaxies with them, of hors d'oeuvres that have not. Yet <laughs> yeah, been like, are, is it in the process <laughs> the of later, gobbling those up? Later. Is it good, tearing them up and and adding? I don't know them? about those specifically. I know that there are so that there are these tidal tails, these streams um, that are pulled out from these dwarf galaxies as they orbit the, the main galaxy. Because you've got um, a tidal forces, you know, you've got stronger on one end and weaker on the other and it stretches it out. And that's um, one of the ways they can 
track where these stars are from. So you mentioned the chemistry. Um, they can see that they all have similar chemistry, but you can also look at their, um, their speed and direction because the stars from a particular dwarf galaxy will all have a certain bulk motion to them um, so that you can treat, you know, what just looks like a bunch of stars in an image, you can trace to where these stars came from. Horizon Brave is asking, I'm curious, do you think that there has been any noticeable violent reaction chemical wise mm -hmm. to gases from two galaxy or nebula colliding? So when galaxies collide, what happens to the gas in them? So that gas um, will, so that gas, when it collides, you get shocks, you get um, higher pressure regions, you get these denser regions, which leads you to star formation. And so when galaxies collide, you often see these, um, you know, these, these beads of these, this, uh, you know, really blue, blue, white, you know, pat, uh, blotch it. I don't know what's called them, like bright areas um, where there's a lot of active star formation. So you get a lot of star formation because the gas collides. But again, the stars that are already there miss each other. So when we see those galaxies with a lot of active star formation in them, we know that they were recently s smashed maybe. into a different galaxy. Maybe. there are other, Yeah, maybe. It doesn't necessarily, if you have a lot of star formation, I don't think that necessarily means that you had an interaction. Um, but you can also see that if something is, you know, if a disc is warped in a weird way, um, you know, that, that was, it was disturbed by a, a nearby passing galaxy that would tell you as well. Yeah. Um, Char JL says, wish I could study astronomy at UVA. I live close enough to it, would nail it all the way to post-grad, but I don't have the money. Oh, what? they do have open observe. Oh, I, got, I don't know what they're doing now COVID wise, but uh, <laughs> yeah. when we're not in a pandemic, yeah. the observatory is is open, uh, I think twice a month that was when I was there. Uh, I was always staffed by grad students. Yeah. Um, a lot of observatories are doing virtual, uh, virtual viewings as well. Yeah. And, and of but course, you guys were the creators of that. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the other thing is like, um, awesome, CosmoQuest, right? So if you want mm -hmm. to get directly involved in in participating in science, in space science, uh, go to CosmoQuest and they'll put you to work in various projects. Like, for example, you know, the people who worked on CosmoQuest um, map chose the helped choose the landing site, essentially mapped every rock on Bennu so that uh, Osiris Rex, oh, sorry, could um, could make its uh, grab its sample. And that was done as a partnership between a, an enormous bunch of community of volunteers, but science minded volunteers and the research team working with the mission. So, so there's, and, and I think astronomy is one of those fields that if you are, if you want to make a contribution, you don't have to get, you don't have to go to 12 years of school to do it. You can, you can confirm exoplanets, you can observe variable stars, you can, um, you can observe, uh, double stars, double, double stars. Star. You can observe objects. You can observe impacts on the moon, um, map, uh, uh occultation. There's a lot of stuff you can do. So it's just mm -hmm. a matter of, there's a and there's a lot of information online how you can get involved in these projects. And right. if you are into it and you're really enjoying yourself, then consider going and getting that astronomy degree. But the, but just know, guy, I was just saying, there, doing graduate level astronomy is a lot of yelling at computer code. It really is, though. <laughs> yeah, my why, recommendation is always that's why just I didn't go get into astronomy science degree program. Yeah. I, to get my hands on hardware more. I mean, I like writing code too, but yeah. like, <laughs> also like hardware. When Bruce Vera Stewart. Rubin comes online, it's going to be the big database programmers who will just yeah. rock it. They're going to yeah. find all the comets and all the asteroids and all the supernovae and all of that. And it's going to be about your skills slicing and dicing databases mm -hmm. because it's dumping petabytes of data out onto the internet that nobody's going to have time to look through and, and it's all freely available. So, so astronomy has turned into computer computers, like everything yeah. computers eat the world. Well, a, a guy in my club just did an exoplanet from 
his with his eight inch um, Schmidt cast of grain from Berkeley. Holy you know? moly! That yeah, is <laughs> I've collected some just... data as well. I haven't processed it yet, but um, if you want to get involved in a citizen science project on exoplanets and you have a you know medium sized telescope like an eight inch, um, the uh, NASA JPL has a program called Exoplanet Watch. Yep. And uh, on that website is an email for the head of that project, Rob Zellum. And uh, there's actually a, a code called Exotic that they're, that they're working on developing. They can use developers for the code and they also uh, need people to test the code and, and yeah. submit data. So Yeah. So it's, so, I mean, if you want to just spend some time uh, looking at rocks, there's projects you can get involved in. If there's if counting craters, um, or if you have some gear, you can do everything from, like I said, observing variable stars all the way to confirming exoplanets. Mm -hmm. And there are even teams of amateur astronomers who are actually uh, discovering exoplanets as well. There was, we did a story on Universe Today about that. There's a, it's, it's kind of amazing how much you can be as involved as you want to be without having to go the academic route. And there's not a lot of jobs in the astronomer Yeah. Like there's a hundred people fighting over one position. Oh, that's not even get it, into. Yeah, more <laughs> I than mean that? it depends, right? So the the traditional assumption is that you go to grad school to get a PhD to be a professor, and that is not how it works anymore because we don't have that many professor positions. So there are a lot of other things that people with astronomy PhDs or any stem phd um do which aren't necessarily a lot of a lot of my friends went into um various aspects of data science um or uh you know went adjacent to astronomy and into um either astronomy education yeah uh, i have a friend who works at the smithsonian i have a friend who works at jpl we all got our phds together yeah. um i don't do a lot of astro i don't I don't hardly do any astronomy research anymore i yeah. now teach and do education research so i might yeah, be the a lot least of places educated to go with it I might be the least educated person on universe today. <laughs> I don't know. About yeah. That. They call it piled higher and deeper for a reason, Fraser. <laughs> it's not, doesn't make you smarter. It definitely uh, fills your head with stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're, we've reached the end of our hour. Molly, did you have any chance at getting that stack or is it? Yeah, it's, it, uh, it's up right now. Okay. Uh, we're looking at the well, M33 got... right now. Yeah, yeah, she's got the flocculent. Yeah. Sort of flocculent. Yes. Yeah, so uh, obviously, have a lot of light pollution. Um, this is a stack of uh, thirty-second images. Um, but if you look carefully, uh, you can see that this whole thing here is a galaxy. So this is Messier thirty-three, the Triangulum Galaxy. The core of it is here, and it's got this really cool. I'm going to zoom in on that. Actually, there's it's got this really cool nebula called uh, i think it's ngc 604 yeah that's better um and yeah i'll come down to that nebula here so this is a nebula that's in that galaxy which <laughs> is about three million light years away so we're looking at a nebula in another galaxy that's amazing so that thing is huge yeah. that thing is is 1500 light years across and it's so big that we can see it from here with you know uh not hubble space telescope you know <laughs> um so that's really cool there's tons of nebula uh in in m33 um there's another one so there cool. um so. and i love that you're getting the colors in it too yeah i am getting yeah. some color yeah. uh, i don't have it really well color balanced right now i just kind of took a took a stab at it adjusted some sliders but you can tell that, that there's red in there and yep. there's blue in there which is the two colors you typically get in nebula yeah that's really cool and that's the other, there's pretty much, there's two galaxies you can see with your unaided eye. Andromeda is the easy one, the one that Linda had. And then the other one is um, is this one, if, you, if you've got really dark skies and really good eyes. Um, speaking of M33, uh, Linda's got a version of it as well, but I don't think this was taken tonight. No, this was taken last year. And this is uh, an hydrogen alpha RGB image. So it, the most of the galaxy is the normal red, green, blue, but these pink regions were hydrogen alpha. These are the H2 regions that Nicole was talking about uh, that are spread throughout the galaxy. And you can kind of see them trace out along the spiral arms there. That is amazing. So, wow. Uh, this is probably about 20 hours, 24 hours of data, something like that. But this was taken from 
here in Northern Virginia where it's not quite as light polluted as where Stuart and Molly are, but pretty close. Yeah, yeah, really impressive work. Um, and then uh, one last image here is uh, the heart. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yay. This is the, we've been watching a lot of Korean dramas. So this is how they do it in, in Korea. And Stuart's got a heart for us. Oh, look Aww. at that. This is the this is a obviously a processed version of it with color. And you killed the stars. Uh, but I, and I killed the stars. <laughs> That's that still blows me away. Like I it, just tamed them. He killed them. Yeah, You're a star yeah, yeah, yeah. You you just tamped them down a notch. <laughs> and not just okay. Took them right I'm out. not okay with this. <laughs> This, this is an M33 that I didn't take with, with my own gear, but um, with a telescope down at Deep Sky West, a wow. uh, corrected Dahl Kirkham. That's and, wonderful, Mom. Uh, yeah, this one, this is hands down my favorite image. I, I mean, it's, it's not my own gear, so I don't usually show it as, as my favorite image, but it's definitely the best image that I have because it was taken with superior gear. <laughs> but just look at how many nebulae there are in that shot. Like it's just, yeah. it's out of yeah, control. Yeah, I love like, here's here's that NGC. Actually, I don't think you can see my mouse uh, in there, but uh, you can see NGC 604, that bright, that nebula that I showed in the live view, see it much better here that uh, pink. in the kind of lower left area, that, that really bright red splotch. And it's like, those what are, are like a bunch of mega Orion nebula. Yeah, they're yeah. even bigger. Yeah, they're, like this Crazy. one is huge, and uh, and what's also cool is that you realize that um, you can see individual stars in this galaxy. That's mm -hmm. three million light years away. Like, like that's crazy cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's really impressive. So one were of the you interesting able to things get... about Molly's image compared to mine is you can see that hers was taken with higher resolution equipment. You know, you can see more detail in the galaxy compared to my image because my image scale is much coarser. And darker yeah. skies as well, right? Yeah, yeah she she probably got more in less time than I did. Yeah, yeah this is actually only five hours of exposure time. Wow. Uh, Dark I, skies I, really help. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's on that FLI <laughs> Kepler 4040, like monstrosity of a CMOS camera that costs like $15,000 or something insane. So <laughs> yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah, so great. So Molly, were you able to get that stack up Mars? Oh, um. It, I, yeah, but it doesn't look very good. Okay, all right. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to massage um, it, I'll. I can, I can throw it up here, but I couldn't. Like the color didn't come out, so I was gonna keep working on that. And, yeah, so maybe next week you can decide. I don't want to. I don't want to put you on the spot. If you're not happy with it, then then we'll wait a week. Um, yeah, it's not very good. Anyway. Okay, well then let's wait. <laughs> let's wait, and then you can you can you can muck around with it, and then maybe people can we can sort of see then. If you can sort of do what uh, do what Shaw did last week and sort of show side by side, so people can see the difference. It was really impressive yeah. to see what the before and after looks like, so people can get a sense. All right. <clears throat> well, I think we've reached the end of our time. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us this week on the Star Party. We'll try again next week. Uh, was it? Can we go earlier? Is six o'clock work for people now? Yes. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, I think it'll so, be it'll be it'll be kind of tight for me, but I think I can. Yeah. What about six thirty? Six thirty would be better. Just well, I'd rather keep it on the hours for now, but but let let Nancy know, and if if six does work, then we can shift to six, and if not, then that's fine. But I'd like to be able to let Linda go to bed at a reasonable hour, even though I know she's an astronomer and they astronomers this is don't. way past yeah. my bedtime. Yeah. And yeah. next week I won't be here anyway. So. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you uh, all the astronomers. Thanks to Stuart and Nicole for, uh, for bringing the, uh, the gab as well. That was awesome to have you guys <laughs> and Molly and Linda. And thanks everyone watching, all the moderators. And of course, a special thank you to Nancy Graziano for working behind the scenes to just uh, herd all the cats. This, I, I am not lying. This would not happen without Nancy's help. So thank you, Nancy. Yes. Everybody thank Nancy. Thank Sorry, you, what did you call Nancy? us? The cats. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Get ready. Nice. Literally, literally. It's just funny because I'm actually horribly allergic to cats. <laughs> <laughs>
but it's fine. <laughs> I've got the green screen filter on, so it's doing weird stuff. But there's one of my one of my cats there, and the other cat is asleep over there. <laughs> yeah, the dogs are not behind me. They could not care less. Let's see. Um, awesome. All right. Well, that was super fun. Uh, thanks. thanks everybody and we'll see you all oh I'm doing another open space on Monday and Chris Carr is going to be my guest on Tuesday he's one of our co-hosts on the weekly space hangout and he's going to talk about extragalactic astronomy so you've got questions about what's happening outside of the galaxy uh, come and talk to Chris all right thanks everybody we'll see you next time all right. thank you bye have a good night